All right, we are back with Chapter 8 of Into the Wild, and uh, I hope you all had a chance to listen to and discuss Chapter 7. Uh, this is a bit of a longer chapter, so I'm going to go ahead and just start, all right? Uh, this is called Chapter 8, Alaska. <clears throat> it says, When McCandless turned up dead in Alaska, and the perplexing circumstances of his demise were reported in the news media, many people concluded that the boy must have been mentally disturbed. The article about McCandless in Outside generated a large volume of mail, and not a few of the letters happened uh, a gorium on McCandless, and on me as well, the author of the story, for glorifying what some thought was a foolish, pointless death. Much of the negative ma mail was sent by Alaskans. One said, Alexander is crazy in my book, wrote a resident of Healy, the hamlet at the head of the Stampede Trail. The author describes a man who has given away a small fortune, forsaken by loving, forsaken his loving family, abandoned his car, watch, and map, and burned the, re the last of his money before traipsing off into the wilderness west of Healy. Another said, personally, I don't see anything positive at all about what McCandless's lifestyle was or how he followed the wilderness doctrine, scolded another respondent. Entering the wilderness purposefully ill-prepared and surviving a near-death experience does not make you a better human, it just makes you lucky, they said. One reader of the outside piece wondered, why would anyone intending to live off the land for a few months forget Boy Scout rule number one, which is be prepared? Why would any son cause his parents and family such permanent and perplexing pain? Krakauer is a kook if he doesn't think Chris Alexander Supertramp McCandless was also a kook, opinion the one, one man from the North Pole in Alaska. McCandless had already gone over the edge and just happened to hit bottom in Alaska, he said. The most strident criticism came from in the form of a dense, multi-page uh, note from Amber, a from Amber, sorry, a tiny village in the Kobuk River north of the Arctic Circle. The author was a writer and school teacher formerly from Washington, D.C., named Nick Jans. Warning, it was 1 a.m. and he was still on the bottom of a bottle of Seagram's when Jan let this one fly. It says in the letter, over the past 15 years, I've run into several McCandless types out in the country. Same story, they're idealistic, energetic young guys who overestimated themselves and underestimated the country and ended up in trouble. McCandless was hard, hardly unique. There's quite a few of these hanging around the state, which are like what uh, so much alike that they're almost a collective cliche. The only difference is that McCandless ended up dead with the story of his idiocracy splash across the media. McCandless is finally just a pale 20th century uh, burlesque of London's protagonist who freezes because he ignores advice and commits big time hubris. His ignorance, which has been cursed by a USGS quadrant and a Boy Scout manual, is what killed him. And, oh, sorry, it did say his ignorance, which could have been cured, sorry, that means that he is saying that he could have prevented this if he just followed those two manuals. And while I feel for his parents, I have no sympathy for him as an individual. Such willful ignorance amounts to disrespect for the land and paradoxically demonstrates the same sort of arrogance that resulted in the Exxon Valdez spill, just another case of underprepared, overconfident men bumbling around out there and screwing up big because they lack the realistic humility, the requisite humility. It's all a matter of degree. McCandless's contrived asceticism and pseudo literary stance compound rather than reduce the fault. McCandless's postcards, notes, and journals red light the work of an above average, somewhat his, uh, histrionic high school kid. Or wait, am I missing something? The letter ended. The prevailing Alaska wisdom held that McCandless was simply one more dreamy, half-cocked greenhorn who went into the country expecting to find answers to all of his problems and instead found only mosquitoes and a lonely death. Dozens of marginal characters have marched off into Alaska wilds over the years, and they never reappear. A few have lodged firmly in the state's collective memory. 
There was a countercultural idealist who passed through the village of Tanana in the early 1970s, announcing that he intended to spend the rest of his life communing with nature, as he said. In midwinter, a field biologist discovered all of his belongings, which were two rifles, some camping gear, a diary filled with incoherent ranting about truth and beauty, and uh, recondite ecological theory, and an empty cabin, cabin near Tofty, its interior filled with drifted snow. There was no trace of the man that was ever found. A few years later, there was a Vietnam veteran who built a cabin on the Black River east of Crystal Stick just to get away from people, as he claimed. In February, he had run out of food and starved, apparently without making any attempt to save himself, despite the fact that there was another cabin stocked with meat just three miles downstream. Writing about his death, Edward Hoagland observed that Alaska is the be not the best site in the world for uh, eremitic experiments or peace love theatrics. And then there was this wayward genius I bumped to on the shore of Prince William Sound in 1981. I was camped in the woods outside of Cordova, Alaska, trying in vain to find work as a deckhand on a, on a scene boat, biding my time until the Department of Fish and Game announced their first opener, the start of the commercial salmon season. One rainy afternoon while walking in town, I crossed paths with an unkept, agitated man who appeared to be about 40 years old. He wore a bush-like black beard and shoulder-length hair, which he kept out of his face with a headband made from filthy nylon strap. He was walking toward me at a brisk clip, hunched beneath the considerable weight of a six-foot-long balance across uh, one shoulder. I said hello as he approached. He mumbled a reply, and we paused to chat in the drizzle. I didn't ask why he was carrying a sodden log into the forest, uh, where there seemed to be plenty of logs there already. After a few minutes spent exchanging earnest uh, banalities, we went our separate ways. From our brief conversation, I deduced that I had just met the, cele the celebrated eccentric who, whom the locals call the mayor of Hippie Cove, a reference to a bite of tide water just north of town that was a magnet for long-haired transients near which the mayor had been living for some years. Most of the residents of Hippie Cove were, like me, summer squatters who'd come to Cordova hoping to score high-paying fishing jobs or, failing that, find work in the salmon canneries. But the mayor, he was different. His real name was Jean Rosalini. He was the eldest stepson of Victor Rosalini, a wealthy Seattle restaurateur and a cousin of Albert Rosalini, the immensely popular governor of Washington state from 1957 to 1965. As a young man, Gene had been so good, such a good athlete and a, and a brilliant student. He read obsessively, practiced yoga, became an expert at the martial arts. He, studied, he sustained a perfect 4.0 grade point average through high school and college. At the University of Washington and later at Seattle University, he immersed himself in anthropology, history, philosophy, and linguistics. Accumulating hundreds of credit hours without collecting a single degree, he saw no reason to. The pursuit of knowledge he maintained was a worthy objective in its own right and needed no external validation. By and by, Rosalini left academia, departed Seattle, and drifted up north to the coast through British Columbia and the Alaska Panhandle. In 1977, he landed in Cordova. There in the forest at the edge of town, he decided to devote his life to an ambitious anthropological experiment. I was interested in knowing if it was possible to be independent of modern technology, he told an Anchorage Daily News re reporter, Deborah McKinney, a decade after arriving in Cordova. He wondered whether humans could live as our, for as, could live as our forebears had when mammoths and saber-toothed tigers roamed the land or whether our species had moved too far from its roots to survive without gunpowder, steel, and other artifacts of civilization. With the obsessive attention to detail that characterized this brand of dog genius, Rosalini purged all his life of all but the most primitive tools, which he fashioned from native materials with his own hands. He became convinced that humans had devolved into progressively inferior beings, McKinley explains, and it was his goal to return to a natural state. 
He was forever experimenting with different eras, the Roman times, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age. By the end of his lifestyle, he had elements of the Neolithic. He dined on roots, berries, and seaweed, hunted game with spears and snares. He was dressed in rags, endured the, the bitter winters with nothing more than that. He seemed to relish the hardship. His home above Hippie Cove was a windowless hovel which he built without benefit of saw or axe. He'd spend days, says McKinney, grinding his way through a log with a sharp stone, as if merely uh, subsisting according to his self-imposed rules that weren't strenuous enough. Rusellini had also exercised compulsively whether he wasn't occupied with foraging. He filled his days with calisthenics, weightlifting and running, often with a load of rocks on his back. During one apparently typical summer, he reported covering an average of 18 miles per day. Rosalini's experiment stretched on for more than a decade, but eventually he felt the question he sorry, but eventually he felt the question that inspired it had been answered. In a letter to a friend, he wrote, I began my adult life with the hypothesis that it would be possible to become a Stone Age native. For 30 years, I programmed and conditioned myself to this end. In the last 10 of it, emotionally, uh, I would say I realistically experienced the physical, mental, and emotional reality of the Stone Age. But to borrow a Buddhist phrase, eventually came, the, came a setting face to face with pure reality. I learned that it is not possible for human beings as we know them to live off the land. Rusellini appeared to accept the failure of his hypothesis with equanimity. At the age of 49, he cheerfully announced that he had recast his goals and next intended to walk around the world, living out of my backpack. I want to cover 18 to 27 miles a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But the trip never got off the ground. In November 1991, Rosalini was discovered lying face down on the floor of his shack with a knife through his heart. The coroner determined that the fatal wound was self-injected, in, inflicted, sorry. There was not a suicide note though. Rosalini left no hint as to why he had decided to, hint, to end his own life and in that manner. It is all likelihood nobody will ever know. Rosalini's death and the story of his outlandish existence made the front page of the Anchorage Daily News. The, tri uh, the travails of John Moulton Waterman, however, attracted less attention. Born in 1952, Waterman was raised in the same Washington suburbs that gave shape to Chris McCandless. His father, Guy Waterman, is a musician and a freelance writer who, among other claims to modest fame, authored speeches for presidents, ex-presidents, and other prominent Washington politicians. Uh, Waterman also happens to be an expert mountaineer who taught his three sons to climb at an early age. John, the middle son, went rock climbing for the first time at 13 years old. He was a natural. John headed to the crags at every opportunity he could and trained obsessively when he couldn't, cl when he couldn't climb. He cranked out 400 push-ups a day and walked two and a half miles of school fast. After walking home in the afternoon, he touched the front door and headed back to school to make a second round trip. In 1969, as a 16-year-old, John climbed Mount McKinley, which he called Denali, as most Alaskans do, preferring the peaks as the Pican name. Becoming the third youngest person to stand atop the highest landform on the continent, over the next few years, he pulled off even more impressive ascents in Alaska, Canada, and Europe. By the time he rolled in the University of Alaska at Fairbanks in 1973, Waterman had established a reputation as one of the most promising young alpinists in North America. Waterman was a small person, barely five feet three inches tall. He had an elfin face and, and the swiney, inexhaustible physique of a gymnast. Uh, Acquaintances remember him as a socially awkward man-child with an outrageous sense of humor and a squirrely, almost manic depressive personality. When I first met John, says James Brady, a fellow climber and college friend, he was prancing across campus in a long black cape and blue Elton John type glasses that had a star between the lenses. He carried around a cheap guitar held together with masking tape and would serenade anybody who would listen 
uh, with long, off-key songs about his adventures. Fairbanks was always attracted to a lot of weird characters, but he was wacky even by Fairbanks standards. Yeah, John was out there, a lot of people didn't know how to handle him, he said. It's not difficult to imagine uh, plausible causes for Waterman's uh, instability. His parents, Guy and Emily Waterman, divorced when he was a teen, and Guy, according to a source close to the family, essentially abandoned his sons following that divorce. He would have nothing more to do with the boys, and it crippled John badly. <clears throat> Not long after his parents split up, John and his older brother Bill went to visit their father, but Guy refused to see them. Um, sorry. Shortly after that, John and Bill went to Fairbanks. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, shortly after that, John and Bill went to Fairbanks to live with an uncle. At one point while they were up there, John got very excited because he heard that his father was coming to Alaska to climb. But when Guy arrived at the state, he never took the trouble to see his sons. He came and went without even ever bothering to visit, and it broke John's heart. Bill, with who John had an extremely close relationship, lost a leg as a teenager trying to hop a freight train. In 1973, Bill posted an enigmatic letter alluding vaguely to plans for an extended trip and then disappeared without a trace. To this day, nobody knows whatever happened to him. And after John learned to climb, eight of his um, intermittent climbing partners were killed in accidents or committed suicide. It's not much of a stretch to poise, deposit that such a rash of misfortune dealt a serious blow to Waterman's young psyche. In 1978, Waterman embarked on his most astonishing expedition, a solo ascent to, of Mount Hunter's Southeast Spur, an unclimbed route that had been previously defeated three teams of elite mountaineers. Writing about the feat in the climbing magazine, the journalist Glenn Randall reported that Waterman described his companions in the climbing, uh, on the climb as the wind and snow and death. Uh, cornices as airy as a meringue jutted over the voids a mile deep. The vertical ice walls as crumbly as a bucket of ice cubes half thawed then refrozen. They led to ridges so narrow and so steep that both sides on the straddling uh, was the easiest solution. At times the pain and loneliness overwhelmed him and he broke down and cried. Uh, after eight, 81 days of exhausting, extremely hazardous climbing, Waterman reached the 14,573 foot summit of Hunter, which rises in the Alaska range immediately south of Denali. Another nine weeks were required to make the only slightly less harrowing descent. In total, Waterman spent 145 days alone on the mountain. When he got back to civilization, he was flat broke. And he borrowed $20 from Cliff Hudson, the bush pilot who'd flown them out of the mountains and returned to Fairbanks, where the only work he could find was washing dishes. Waterman was nevertheless hailed as a hero by the small fraternity of Fairbanks climbers. He gave a public slideshow of the Hunter Ascent that Brady calls unforgettable. It was an incredible performance, completely uninhibited. He poured out all of his thoughts and all of his feelings, his fear of failure, his fear of death. It was like you were there with him. In the moments following the epic deed, though, Waterman discovered that instead of putting his demons to rest, success had merely agitated them. Waterman's mind began to unravel. John was a very self-critical individual, always analyzing himself, Brady recalls, and he'd always been kind of compulsive. He used to carry around a stack of clipboards and notepads. He would take copious notes, creating a complete record of everything he did during the course of every single day. I remember running into him once downtown in Fairbanks. As I walked up, he got a clipboard, logged, it, uh, logged in the time that he saw me, and recorded what our conversation was about which wasn't much at all. His notes on our meeting were three or four pages down behind all the other stuff he'd already scribbled for that day. Somewhere he must have had piles and piles and piles of notes like that, which I'm sure would have made sense to no one except John. Soon thereafter, Waterman ran for the local school board on a platform promoting 
um, unrestricted rules for students and the legalization of hallucinogenic drugs. Of course, he lost that election to nobody's surprise, save his own, but immediately launched another political campaign, this time for the presidency of the United States. He ran under the banner of Feed the Starving Party, the main priority of which was to ensure that nobody on the planet ever died from hunger again. To publicize his campaign, he laid plans to make a solo ascent of the south face of Denali, the mountain's steepest aspect, in winter with the minimum of food. He wanted to underscore the waste and immorality of the standard American diet. As part of his training regimen for the climb, he immersed himself in baths filled with ice. Waterman flew to the Catalina Glacier in December 1979 to begin the ascent, but called it off after only 14 days. Take me home, he reportedly told his bush pilot. I don't want to die. Two months later, however, he prepared for a second attempt. But in the village south of Denali, that, um, that is the point of embarkation for most mountaineering expeditions into the Alaska Range, the cabin he was staying in caught fire and burned to rubble incinerating both his equipment and the voluminous accumulation, accumulation of notes, poetry, and personal journals that he regarded as his life's work. Waterman was completely unhelmed by the loss. The day after the fire, he committed himself to the Anchorage Psychiatric Institute, but left after two weeks, convinced that there was a conspiracy afoot to put him away permanently. Then, in the winter of 1981, he launched yet another solo attempt to, on Denali. As if climbing the peak alone in winter weren't challenging enough, this time he decided to get up the ante even further by beginning his ascent at sea level, which entailed walking 160 hard miles from the shore of Cook Inlet just to reach the foot of the mountain. He started plodding north from the tidewater in February, but his enthusiasm fizzled on the lower reaches of the Ruth Glacier, still 30 miles from the peak. So he aborted the attempt and retreated to uh, Tal uh, Tal sorry, Talquinta. In March, however, he mustered his resolve once more and resumed his lonely trek. Before leaving town, he told the pilot, Cliff Hudson, whom he regarded as a friend, that I won't be seeing you again. Uh, it was an exceptionally cold March on the Alaska Range. Late in the month, Muggs a uh, stump crossed paths with Waterman on the Upper Ruth Glacier. Stump, an alpinist of world renown who died on Denali in 1992, had just completed a new route on a nearby peak. The Moose's Tooth is what it was called. Shortly after the, uh, his chance encounter with Waterman, Stump visited me in Seattle and remarked that John didn't seem like he was all there. He was acting spacey and talking about some crazy stuff. Supposedly, Sorry. Supposedly, during this big winter ascent of Denali, he, had, he hardly had any gear with him. He was wearing a cheap one-piece snowmobile suit and wasn't even carrying a sleeping bag. All he had in the way of food was a bunch of flour, some sugar, and a big can of Crisco. In his book, Breaking Point, Glenn Randall writes, For several weeks, Waterman lingered in the area of the Sheldon Mountain House. An air, a small cabin perched on the side of the Ruth Glacier in the heart of the range. Kate Bull, a friend of Waterman's who was climbing in the area at the time, reported that he was run down and less cautious than usual. He used the radio he had borrowed from Cliff to call him and have him fly in more supplies. Then he returned the radio when he um, had, then he returned the radio that he had borrowed, sorry. I won't be needing this anymore, he said. The radio would have been his only means of calling for help. Waterman was last placed on the northwest fork of the Ruth Glacier on April 1st. His tracks led toward the east buttress of Denali, uh, straight through a labyrinth of giant, giant crevasses, evidence that he had made no apparent effort to circumvent obvious hazards. He was not seen again, and it is assumed that he broke through a thin snow barge and plummeted to his death at the bottom of one of the steep fissures. The National Park Service searched Waterman's intended route from the air for a week following his disappearance, but found no sign. Some climbers later discovered a note atop a box of Waterman's gear inside the Sheldon Mountain House. 3-13-81, they read. My last kiss. 
1.42 p.m. Perhaps, evidently, parallels have been drawn between John Waterman and Chris McCandless. Comparisons have also been drawn between McCandless and Carl McCunn, an, un, uh, an affable uh, absent-minded Texan who moved to Fairbanks during the 1970s oil boom and found lucrative employment on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Construction Project. In early March 1981, as Waterman was making his final journey into the Alaska Range, McCunn hired a bush pilot to drop him off in a remote lake near Colleen River. It was about 75 miles northeast of Fork Yukon on the southern bridge of the Brooks Range. A 35-year-old amateur photographer, McCunn told friends that the main reason for the trip was to shoot pictures of wildlife. He flew into the country with 500, 500 rolls of film, um, 22 and 3030 caliber rifles, a shotgun, and 1,400 pounds of provisions. His intention was to remain in the wilderness through August. Somehow, though, he neglected to arrange for a pilot to fly him back to civilization at the summer's end, and it cost him his life. This astounding oversight was a great surprise to Mark Stoppel, a young Fairbanks resident who had come to know McCunn well during the nine months that he had worked on the pipeline with him together, shortly before the lanky Texan departed for the Brooks Range. Carl was a friendly, extremely popular, down-home sort of guy, he recalls, and he seemed like a smart guy, but there was a side to him that was a little bit dreamy, a little bit out of touch with reality. He was flamboyant. He liked to party hard. He could be extremely responsible, but he had a tendency to wing it sometimes, to act impulsively, and to get on bravado and style. No, I guess it doesn't really surprise me that Carl went out there and forgot to arrange to be picked up. But then I'm not easily shocked either. I've had several friends who drowned or got murdered or died in weird accidents. In Alaska, you just get kind of used to this strange stuff happening. In late August, as the days grew shorter and the air turned sharp, and an autumn knoll on the Brooks Range, McCunn began to worry that nobody arrived to fly him out. I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure, he confessed in his diary, significant portions of which were published posthumously in a five-part story by Chris Capps in the Fairbanks Daily News Minor. I'll soon find out. Week by week, he could feel the accelerating advance of winter. As his food supply grew meager, McCunn deeply regretted uh, tossing out about a dozen of his shotgun shells into the lake. Uh, I keep thinking of all the shotgun shells I threw away about two months ago, he wrote. I had five boxes, and when I kept seeing them sitting there, I felt rather city silly for having brought so many. He said, I felt like a warmonger, which was real bright. Uh, who would have known I might need them just to keep from starving? Then, on a brisk September morning, deliverance seemed to be at hand. McCunn was stalking ducks with what remained of his ammunition when the stillness was rocked by the buzz of an airplane, which soon appeared overhead. The pilot spotting the camp circled twice at a low altitude for a closer look. McCunn waved wildly with a fluorescent orange sleeping bag cover. The aircraft was equipped with wheels rather than floats and thus could not land. But McCunn was certain he'd been seen and had no doubt the pilot would summon a float plane to return for him. He was sure of this, uh, he recorded in the journal, that said, I stopped waving after the first pass and then got, uh, then got busy packing things up and getting ready for the uh, break camp. But no airplane arrived that day or the next day or the next. Eventually McCunn looked on the back of his hunting license and understood why. Printed in the little square of paper were drawings of emergency hand signals for communicating with aircraft from the ground. I recall raising my right hand shoulder, uh, I recall raising my right hand shoulder high and shaking my fist at the plane second pass, McCunn wrote. It was a little cheer like when your team scored a touchdown or something. Unfortunately, as he learned too late, Raising a single arm is the universally recognized signal for all is okay, assistance not necessary. The signal for SOS and to send immediate help is two upraised arms. That's probably why after they flew somewhat away, they returned for one more pass and on that I gave them no signal at all. In fact, I may have even turned back to the plane as it passed. McCunn mused philosophically, they probably blew me off as a weirdo. By the end of September, snow was piling up on the tundra, 
and the lake had frozen over. All, as the provisions he brought ran out, Macon made an effort to gather rose hips and snare rabbits. At one point, he managed to scavenge meat from a diseased caribou uh, that had wandered onto the lake and then died. By October, however, he had metabolized most of his body fat and was having difficulty staying warm during the long, cold nights. Certainly, someone in town would have figured out something and uh, must be wrong. Maybe me not being back by now, he noted, but still no plan appeared. It would be just like Carl to assume that somebody would magically appear to save him, says Stoppel. He was a teamster. He drove a truck, so he had plenty of downtime on the job, just sitting on his butt inside the rig and daydreaming, which is how he came up with the idea for the Brooks Ridge trip. It was a, it was a serious quest for him. He spent the better part of a year thinking about it, planning it, figuring it out, talking to me during our breaks about what gear to take. But for all the careful planning he did, he also indulged in some wild fantasies. For instance, he continues, Carl didn't want to fly into the bush alone. His big dream originally was to go off and live in the woods with a beautiful uh, woman. He was attracted to at least a couple different girls who worked with us, and he spent a lot of time and energy talking to Sue or Barbara, or whoever was into accompanying him, which in itself was pretty much pure fantasy. There was no way he was going. this was going to happen. I mean, at the pipeline camp where we worked, Pump Station 7, there were probably 40 guys for every woman. But Carl was a dreaming kind of guy. And, and right up until he flew into Brooks Range, he kept hoping and hoping and hoping that one of these girls would change their mind and decide to go with him. Similarly, Stoppel explains, Carl is the sort of guy who would leave unrealistic expectations that someone would eventually figure out when he was in trouble and would cover for him. Even as he was on the verge of starving, he probably still imagined that Big Sue was going to be flying in at the last minute with a plain load of food and his wild romance with him. But his fantasy world was far off from the scale that nobody was able to connect with. McCunn's food supply dwindled almost to nothing. He wrote in his journal, I'm getting more and more worried. To be honest, I'm starting to get a bit scared. The thermometer dipped to minus five degrees Fahrenheit. Painful and pus-filled frostbite blisters forms on his fingers and his toes. Uh, it continues, sorry. The part of the interior where Carl went is, rem is a remote, very blank part of Alaska, says Stoppel. It gets colder than hell there in the winter. Some people in the situation might have figured out a way to walk out or maybe winter over, but to do that, you'd have to be extremely resourceful. You'd really need to have your stuff together. You'd have to be a tiger, a killer, an animal. And Carl was too laid back and a party boy to do that. There are similarities among Rosalini, Waterman, McCunn, and McCandless. Like Rosalini and Waterman, McCandless was a seeker and he had an empirical fascination with the harsh side of nature. Like Waterman and McCunn, he displayed a staggering, um, excuse me, staggering policy of common sense. But unlike Waterman, McCandless uh, wasn't mentally ill. And unlike McCunn, he didn't go into the bush assuming someone would automatically appear to save his life before he came to grief. McCandless didn't conform particularly well to the bush casualty stereotype. Although he was rash, untoutered, and in the ways of the bad country, he was, the point of, he was incautious to the point of foolhardiness, but he wasn't incompetent. He wouldn't have lasted 113 days out there if he were. And he wasn't a nutcase. He wasn't a sociopath. He wasn't an outcast. McCandless was something else, although precisely what is hard to say. Some insight into the tragedy of Chris McCandless can be gained by studying predecessors cut from the same exotic cloth. And in order to do that, one must look beyond Alaska to the Bald Rock Canyons of southern Utah. There, in 1934, a particular 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 boy walked into the desert and never came out. His name was Everett Bruis. All right. So that was a really long chapter, uh, a lot to get through, and I wouldn't blame anybody if they had to maybe watch this in two different parts. Um, but I'm interested to see where everybody thinks we are right now. We're kind of starting to draw comparisons between the main character of this book and some other people from um, Alaska's history that have kind of 
come before him and done similar adventures. Um, so it seems pretty interesting. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it, and until next time, bye.